Thank you so much, Tunde, for that reading. Thank you so much to uh, Tunde and for all of us here in church, for those at home on YouTube, or if you're tuning in on Zoom, <coughs> do open your Bible, if you have one, to Ephesians 4. Let me just pray for us. Our Father, we do thank you so much as we continue in this great book of Ephesians. As we come now to this point where Paul changes from primarily thinking about what you have done and what you are like to thinking about how we should respond. We pray for your help. We pray that your spirit would lead us and guide us into the truth. Help us, we pray, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. As I just mentioned at the, in my prayer just now, uh, we've been in three chapters of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians actually has one of the most classic layouts of a New Testament uh, um, kind of letter. You'll see this pattern repeated, particularly in Paul's letters. Uh, often, if you look at the overall structure of one of his letters, you'll see that he spends half talking primarily about what the gospel is, what God is like, what he has done, what the plight of humanity uh, is, and why God needed to do that. That's what we call doctrine, it's truth, it's, uh, it's the gospel. And of course, uh, the second half is also the gospel, but that part of the gospel is primarily thinking what, uh, what's our problem, what is God like, and what has he done about that problem. And then in the second half of his letters, he will always move on to how we should respond. Now I want to say, that it is so important that both halves are kept together when it comes to Christian uh, understanding of the gospel. In other words, you can't, it's like two sides of the same coin. You must keep together what God has done and how we should respond always. Churches that fail, who, who, you know, ju who just, just think about what has God done, well, it, that gives way to license, actually. In other words, it, human behavior is irrelevant. We can do whatever we want. But churches that just focus on the other side of the gospel, uh, where it's just about how we should act and behave, well, that gives way to Pharisaism. It, it gives way to human pride, actually. It's a disgusting and ugly thing to say, to forget that actually everything is a response to what God has done to us to forget that and turn the church into some kind of business empire that's based on human strategy and thinking. No, no, no. So both halves are needed. We must never forget what God has done. We must always keep that. But we also must never forget that it demands a response from us. The Christian gospel is not God, God saves us by his grace, therefore you don't need to bother. That's a, a, a heresy. In fact, Paul would have it, us think the very other way around. You'll see it repeated endlessly in his writing. Because God has done such amazing things for you, therefore use your effort in his service. It's God who's at work among you. So why are you not using all your resources for this wonderful thing he's done? In Romans, he puts it like this, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. That's always the way it works for Paul. In Philippians, he says the same thing. Do your best because it is God who is at work among you. So you see, he, doesn't, he never thinks, oh, the gospel is God's done such wonderful things, therefore I can now bail out and do nothing. Paul's like, God's done such wonderful things, therefore I should engage just like if I was told that the Queen was going to come to St. Mildred's, I wouldn't go, wow, someone so important's blessing me with her presence, I'll do nothing. No, I'd say, oh my goodness, something so amazing's happening, therefore let's get ready. And that's how you should think about the Gospel. It's that way round. It's never God is wor at work in, among you, therefore do nothing. <laughs> that's just stupid if I can just put it bluntly. It's God is at work in you, therefore this should occupy everything. That's the way Paul sees it. In fact, I, I'm going to be quite challenging here. If you want to know how seriously 
you really take the doctrine of the gospel, if I want to know how seriously, Tom, do you really believe all that stuff you say you believe about Jesus? Do you know where I need to look? I need to look at my life. It shows itself in my wallet and my diary. I can't escape it. It's, it's Tom, when you want to know whether Jesus means anything to you, don't look at the sort of things you say. Look at what you actually do. Does it change your life? Here's something else that's even more challenging. And I'm going to say this morning, I'm a Protestant Christian. And that, what that means is, that I'm a sort of a, 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 a benefiter of the Reformation. But one of the problems of being a Protestant Christian, when you compare the Orthodox Church or the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church actually have no problem. People sort of understand, kind of instinctively, how important the church is in, in Catholic and Orthodox churches. For me, I, I have disagreements with the way they would get to that point. But nevertheless, the, the significance of the church in Catholicism and in the Orthodox Church is very obvious. But it, Protestants often abandon that and they forget how important the church is. But just look at what Paul is saying in this passage. If I want to know how, how seriously I take Jesus, I look at my life. More specifically, Paul would say, if I want to know how seriously I take Jesus, I look at my relationships because that's what he's going to go on. He, all he cares about is how we treat each other. More specifically, if I want to know how seriously I take Jesus, I look at my church relationships. That's what Paul's saying in this passage. In fact, I would argue that's what Jesus says in the Gospels. We won't go into where, because so we haven't got time. That's what the New Testament says generally. I will know how seriously I take Jesus by how seriously, how carefully, how lovingly I treat his people. That is a huge theme of the New Testament. Very challenging, but nevertheless it's there, and that's why the first thing... Now, let me rush quickly. I've got to say this quick, Tom. You always take too much time. Uh, that isn't to say that your family and your work and your non-Christian relationships aren't there too. It, they are because the rest of Ephesians will come on to those things. Of course, how, treat, how you treat Jesus, how seriously you treat Jesus shows itself, not just in church relationship, but of course with the world and non-Christians and in how you treat your workplace and how you treat your family. But Paul starts, his starting point is with how you treat the church. Because the church is Jesus' precious, treasured possession. <laughs> The church is his people. You know, it's, it's, I'm getting, I, I, it is the family of God. So how, how I treat the family of God is the, is the most revealing thing in how I actually think about Jesus. Of course, other things reveal it too. So don't, don't miss over, overinterpret what I've just said. Now, I've got to be quick. Let me just check how I'm doing. We are going to just look at two things that Paul says here, and then I'm just going to have a response, because I, I wish I had liked longer on this passage. I don't think there is. I mean, this is one of the most significant passages in the New Testament, in the Bible, for understanding the church. There are so many others as well, but this is one of them. It's so amazingly deep. There's so much to say, but we can't say too much. So we're going to say, number one, how do I show... Uh, the, the gospel in my life will come on to other things as the book goes on. As I said earlier, family and church, uh, work and non-Christians and, uh, you know, will come on to other things. But how do I show that the gospel really matters, Jesus really matters to me in how I treat his people? Well, firstly, I do that by prioritizing unity. Prioritizing unity. And that is the first half of chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. It's all about the unity. Now, Paul is absolutely clear. He has this little creed. There is one, uh, well, let me read it so I get it right. Uh, make every effort. There is one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. It's like really obvious. One, 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 one. You can't have two churches. Here's the thing. 
The unity of the church comes from Jesus. It comes from God the Father. It comes from the Spirit. That's why he talks about the unity of the Spirit. That's what that phrase means. And that's why he goes on about there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I don't get to decide what the church is like. Jesus has already done that. And he's created one church. He's created one body, just as there is only one God. Uh, it's not, he didn't, Jesus didn't see the need to wait for my opinion. He just decided what the church was going to be like and that he'd only have one church. You see, my job is therefore to respond to the fact that Jesus has done that by prioritizing the unity of that church. I don't get to choose my brothers and sisters in Christ. I just get to love them. Jesus does that. He chooses the church. You might say, I find these people blum and annoying. Yes, that's why Paul says, bear with one another. Have you not read it? In fact, you could translate that, 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 that Greek phrase, put up with each other. Just put up with each other, even if you don't like one another, because that's what it means to be in the wonderful church of Jesus. There is only one church. Jesus isn't going to go, oh, Tom's got a problem with these, this group over here, so I know what I'll do, I'll have two churches for him. No. What will happen is, I will be ejected from the one church by him if I persistently refuse to accept his church. That he's not going to give me another one. There will be no corner of heaven for Tom Lake because he cannot cope with the church Jesus has created. He's just going to say, Tom, bear with. <laughs> Put up love, seek unity. And actually, what you'll discover when you do that is you'll begin to see the really beautiful thing he's doing. I um, <laughs> don't know why that phrase really hit me there, but as a pastor, I have a great privilege, a great challenge, but also a great privilege. Sometimes when I find it hard, I have to go back and read Eugene Peterson because he really helps me. Sometimes when I say, you know, the church is a hard place, it's frustrating, it's not quite how I'd have it. And I, I read Eugene and he says to me, he reminds me of what the Bible says, which is, Tom, just, just bear with and then, and then, and this is the other half of the privilege that I have, as a pastor. You'll get this too. If you commit to the church, you'll have this privilege too, but it is my full-time work, so I often see it. Sometimes you get the glimpse. It's like the curtain just comes back for a moment, and you see that from this diverse group of people, a bride is being formed, beautiful and glorious. And when I when I say, no, the church must be like I'd have it, I miss out on that. I miss out on the fact that, yeah, Jesus is bringing together a completely diverse group of people from all different backgrounds, and he's making them one. He's making them care less about their own individual preference and more about each other. He's making this group of people who are so different come together to be a family. And I get to see, and this is what Eugene Peterson says, stand in awe of it. Stand in awe of the church. Because it's Jesus doing something wonderful to bring his bride into being. So we must, and Paul is clear, you must walk worthily, because of, although the unity of the church comes from God, and this is the paradox, nevertheless, we have to make every effort to keep it. Again, it's that, that gospel thing, that it's not, human effort is not divorced from the gospel ever. So although the unity of the church is, comes from the Spirit, it comes from Jesus, it comes from the Father, nevertheless, we as his people must make every effort to keep that unity. Um, we must make every effort to do it. And Paul says there are a few things that you must do um, if you want to do that, and I need to be quick. He says... Walk humbly, walk gently, and be patient, bear with each other. So individually, how do I protect the unity of the church? I walk humbly, I walk gently, 
I, put, I bear with people. I'm, I'm patient with people. Being humble, it means being unpretentious and lowly. Being gentle, it means I'm not self-important. Being patient means I'm not easily provoked. Tim Keller says, humble people, they don't think less of themselves, as if like being humble is thinking I'm a dreadful individual. No, humble people don't think less of themselves. They, they just think of themselves less. That's a powerful thing. In other words, I, I actually think of other people more <laughs> and myself less. That's what it means to be humble. It's not sit, going home and whipping myself with a stick, going, "How what an evil and horrible, terrible person I am. It's actually saying, no, I just, I just acknowledge the significance of others. I, that I keep in tension with the significance I know that I have as well. Behind disunity, there is always pride and self seeking but humility gentleness patience bearing with each other helps us to stay united that's how i maintain the unity of the spirit i relate my individuality to the whole i bring myself as an individual and see myself as part of this group this family jesus told us that we are always quicker to spot mistakes in other people than in ourselves. That's what he meant by the log in the eye. He's actually saying humanity is always easy. It spots other people's mistakes much quicker than we spot ourselves. So we have to be self-reflective. We have to ask ourselves, where is it? Where am I not walking humbly and gently and patiently with people? Help me to do that, Lord. Help me to do that. The second thing, if the first thing is prioritizing unity, the second thing is prioritizing growth. Now, earlier we saw the paradox that the unit, although the unity comes from God, nevertheless, we must make every effort to keep that unity. We must, we must act on the, what God has done. Here, the paradox is that the, the growth, Paul says, comes from Jesus. The growth of the church comes from him. He, he literally says that in the passage, um, verse 16, from him, Jesus, the whole body builds itself up. And yet, he also says, as each part person plays their part. So I can't, again, I can't say the growth comes from Jesus, therefore I don't need to do anything. It's not, it's never that way in the Bible. It's the growth comes from Jesus, but I have my part to play. That growth that comes from Jesus comes through his people and through his spirit. So keep that, that together. The growth comes from Jesus as each part does its work. Now, what that does, let me just rush in to say how this helps us. That stops me from abandoning my responsibility. The fact that the growth comes from Jesus, but each part must play its, each person must play their part. That stops me from abandoning my own responsibility, but it also stops me from being crushed by that responsibility. This is really important if you ever get involved in, in ministry, because it's quite easy to make the mistake, you know, you uh, make the mistake of, I don't need to do anything because it comes from Jesus. Well, that's a mistake because it, that's not what the type of Bible teaches. But it also, you know, you might get involved in ministry and then you get crushed by it. And you then need to remember, hang on a sec, no, 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 the, the growth comes from Jesus. Okay, he's not, he's not given all the responsibility to me. It's actually from him through his whole church. I just need to play my part. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay, I don't need to bear on my shoulders the weight of the whole church as if, I'm, as, as if the growth comes from me. No, it comes from him. But nevertheless, I also do have a part to play. Fulfill your responsibility, nothing more, nothing less. Now, Paul uses three images. I don't know if you can see them on the screen tech team um, um, to help us understand this growth. There is a slide there. And if you go through the passage, you'll see that he uses three images. One is the image of a child. And that reminds us that the church must constantly grow, just like a child must constantly grow into adulthood. So the church must always be growing, adding new members, growing in our own discipleship. The second image is the image of a boat. 
and he talks about it being blown around here and there, and what's blowing it about is the wind of teaching that comes from the world. Do you realize that you're in, and I'm in, and we're in, great danger that we'll accept things that come from this world, teaching that comes from the world, that actually is not from God. And that teaching will blow us about. It has the potential to throw us over. But it's through the church. This is, this is where the, doctrine, the Protestant doctrine of the church really gets really massive. It's through the church that I'm kept safe. Of course, it's from Jesus that I'm kept safe, but it's through his church. Paul says, we will not be blown about when the church gets strong, <laughs> you know, from Jesus. And then the other image is the image of the human body, um, which is uh, the idea there is that each part, just as in the human body, you've got lots of different parts, fingers, eyes, feet, and they all work together so that your body actually works, you know, you, you, you function. And the image there is that we all are like different parts of the body. We have a different gift, a different responsibility, but when we all do that together, we function effectively. Okay, so um, here we go. Let me just see where I am in my notes. The word Paul uses for an individual and the gifts that God has given in verse seven is grace. Again, he says, Jesus gave that grace. And he really labours in the middle. I had to think, why does Paul put this thing right into the middle where he goes on about Jesus being ascended and this triumphal procession? And it's quite long in the passage. And the reason is because he's wanting you to remember that just as you don't get to decide what the church is like, he did, you also don't get to decide what your responsibility in that church is. Jesus does. <laughs> Some days when I'm like, I why do I have to do this or whatever? I've got to come back to that and go, no, it's because I didn't decide. It wasn't my decision what I would be given. It was his. And it's not your decision either. It's his. And it's not your decision what gift he'll give to other people either. I have no right to ring anybody up on the phone and demand that they act like an administrator or demand that they come and serve in the worship group or something because I can't guarantee that that's the responsibility that Jesus has given to that person. It may well be, and I might be right, and of course sometimes we need each other to be sharpened and challenged and things like that, so I may have the right to pick up the phone and challenge someone to think about it. But what I'm trying to say is, Jesus gives the gifts, he gives the grace to me and to others. He decides who has what function. Okay, but as each part, and then in verse 12, sorry, uh, what are these graces that Jesus has given to people? What are they? Well, in verses 11 and 12, it's people. He actually says he's given pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets. So, and then later on, he says to prepare God's people for works of service. So we should see each other as God's gift to the church, people. And then he talks about works of service in verse 12. So, it, so these, the graces, people work, doing works of service, Verse 15 talks about speaking the truth in love. And verse 16 says, each part doing its work. So what is the grace? Well, the grace that Jesus has given is individual people using their talents, their abilities in acts of service, in, in playing their part, in working for the common good. That's what he's referring to here. And part of that is speaking the truth in love, but there's lots of other things. Now, I want to just say very quickly, I'm aware of the time here. Um, again, here we have the unity and the diversity of the church. The unity and the diversity. And for the church to grow healthy and strong, both are needed, that unity, but also that diversity of different people. Now, let me just say about the gifts before I move on to some application now, very quickly. I'm, again, I'm watching the time. The gifts are varied, okay? You might be at home or here in church thinking, well, you know, what's my gift? And, and, and it's, it, there are some that are really obvious because they're really upfront things. So, you know, it's, there's a always been a temptation in the church, you can see it in the book of Corinthians, to over-prioritize individual gifts. And Paul tells the Corinthians off for doing that. So when the modern church does it, it's like, it's embarrassing. Just read Corinthians. It's been done before. It's a mistake. Don't do it again. Don't over-prioritize. 
Nevertheless, there are some gifts. Paul does say, do seek the, the higher gifts. Nevertheless, there are some that we should all seek after. But we mustn't say, oh, you know, be too bland in our understanding of what these gifts are. So, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, healings, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, interpretation of tongues, uh, teaching, helping. That's a really general idea, isn't it? Just helping someone administration or guidance. He talks about uh, serving in Romans 12. He talks about giving. I mean, how, how often have we said that? Isn't this person just unbelievably generous? Isn't that a wonderful gift to the church? Uh, leading, showing mercy. That's a gift, just being a merciful person. You may just be one of those people who's tr tremendously burdened when you see other people in trouble, when you see them in sin. That's a gift. And actually, you, if you study them, serving is, Peter mentions hospitality and just serving. These are just general words, actually. <laughs> so there's not like, you, you, none of us should be too narrow or bland in our understanding. The New Testament has a whole range of words to use for what these gifts are. And some of those words are actually very general. Like I say, like just being a merciful person or just serving or just being an administrator or just having discernment or just... Uh, helping somebody or being generous in your giving. So it doesn't mean what Paul is not saying is official roles. The official roles of the church, like vicar, are the only ones that those are the gifts. <laughs> no, it's, not. it's just being an authentic Christian using what God's burdened you with and placed on your heart and what you're able to do for his good and for the good of the church. Okay. Inter interest, in, just let me just say one last thing quick. Intercession. I just want to put a big one out there for the intercessors. Because it's so easy to overlook these people. But I just want you to know I don't overlook that. I, I know who some of the intercessors in our church are. And sadly, some of them have passed away or they've moved away. And I'm always gutted because I think, oh, we've got to have intercessors. No one will ever know that they're doing it. But without them, the church will crumble. Jesus knows if you're an intercessor. And I know how important intercession is for the church. No one will ever see it, but it, it is vital. Okay, let me just stop because uh, I want to just have a quick application. I'm so conscious of the time here. Let me just stop now. We're going to sing a new song now. So I'll just invite Marcus and and Susie to come. It's a song that really picks up on so much of what we've said in what we've learned about. I really, I'm going to just have to just say one final thing because I, I, I just want us to be able to sing this song and really use it as a response. It will be new to many of us. But let me just invite us again as I just take a moment to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us that we might prioritize that unity and that growth of the church. That we might say, let's, 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 let's be God's family together. Let me, as an individual, prioritize that unity, but also that growth of the church. So Holy Spirit, we do invite you to help us to understand, to lead us, to show us where we where we might need to change ourselves or where we might need to change as a church, where we might need to remove blockages that stop people using their gifts or where we might need to step up ourselves and start using them. Lord, where there have been moments where we struggle with each other, get upset by one another, we're frustrated. God, give us grace, the grace of repentance to strive for that unity, that peace, to bear with one another. And Lord, we pray in, in, your, in your mercy that we would be a growing church, protected from the wind and the waves, growing from infancy to mature adulthood, and each part, each one of us, playing our part, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.